Hello everyone. Today I'm going to show everyone the process of mitosis and meiosis. I finally saved up enough money to buy an electron microscope. I can't afford to eat now, but at least I can look at cell parts. I'm going to look at a cell undergoing mitosis first. Most likely an immune system cell because of how many the body has. I'm going to go over here and... First, I'm going to look at the cell normally to compare it to my electron microscope. I'm just going to peek down through the tube and... Oh, look! A neutrophil undergoing mitosis. Neutrophils are somatic cells, or body cells. Mitosis in neutrophils takes around 14 days to produce two cells, which wouldn't be very effective if the body didn't already have billions of neutrophils undergoing this process. Now looking at the cell under a compound microscope, it looks like it's sitting there, doing apparently nothing. Instead, the cell is bustling with activity, readying itself for reproduction. This process is known as interphase, and is one of two parts of mitosis. First, we can see the cell grow a little bit in G1, the first phase of interphase. This is to make room for replicated cell bits in synthesis. This process sure would take a while if I didn't have my plot convenience inator to speed things up. If I just walk over to my handy dandy $20,000 electron microscope, just gotta flick some levers, press the button, and now it's on. Through our telescope, we can see into the nucleus. In the nucleus, genetic material known as chromatin is replicating itself. We must have entered the S phase, or synthesis. This is when the cell replicates its organelles and genetic material. This is because in order to have two genetically identical cells, you need two sets of genetically identical DNA and organelles. What better way to get it than from the parent cell itself? Once the cell has replicated all genetic material and organelles it needs, we can finally move on to G2, the second growth phase. G2 ensures that the cell has enough cytoplasm to return to two normal-sized cells after it splits. Finally, on to the exciting part. The cell begins PMAT. Now you may ask, what is PMAT? Well, PMAT is an acronym that stands for prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. These are the steps needed in order for the cell to split. If we look into our electron microscope, we can finally see inside of the cell, with all the crazy organelles moving about. In prophase, organelles f known as centrioles, which are exclusive to animal cells, let loose spindle fibers to help move genetic material across the cell. Speaking of genetic material, Breaking news! Genetic material of this cell has just condensed into chromosomes. About time the cell cleaned up that mess. It was getting all twisted. These chromosomes are identical on both sides, so they must be known as sister chromatids. These sister chromatids will stay in the nucleus until it is dissolved by enzymes. Oh no. Prophase ends when the spindle fibers have emerged from the centrioles, and the chromosomes are floating freely inside of the cell. In metaphase, the spindle fibers from prophase latch onto the centromeres that connect the sister chromatids and pull them towards the equator of the cell. At the end of metaphase, all of the spindle fibers are attached to the centromeres of the sister chromatids. After this, anaphase will begin. In anaphase, the spindle fibers of the centromeres pull apart the chromosomes, separating the sister chromatids from one another. How tragic. Anyways, these chromatids are pulled to the opposite ends of the cell. Hopefully the organelles followed them, but the spindle fibers don't seem to care much for them. 
Now telophase can begin. During telophase, the nuclear membranes will re-emerge around the separated chromatids, and they will begin to decondense into chromatin again. The cell will begin to indent, signaling that the cell is beginning to split. But wait, a secret, but not very secret, phase. Cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is where the cell actually splits and forms two new daughter diploid cells. And look at that, two new cells. So what's so special about these brand new cells? Well, let's break it down. These two new cells are diploid somatic daughter cells. Diploid cells have 46 chromosomes, or 23 sets of chromosomes, if you so choose. Each and every set of chromosome is identical to the parent cell's chromosome. This means that the cell is practically identical to the parent cell, from looks to genetic content. So we know what diploid and daughter means, but what does somatic mean? Somatic means that these are body cells. Somatic cells make up your heart, skull, skin, and everything else. Mitosis is great for everything. Your body uses it to heal injuries by replicating damaged cells. In a similar fashion, growth happens because of mitosis too. Cells slowly replicate and help you get taller until you, well, don't. Immune cells, such as our lovely neutrophils, use mitosis to replicate and fight onslaughts of viruses and bacteria. The only downsides are a lack of genetic variation, because every cell is the same. Same cells, no variation. If all genetic material from the parent cell is passed down to the daughter cells, then both cells will be identical. While there may be no genetic variation, this is a small price to pay for the easiest, best, and most simple cellular reproduction process. Every single cell in the body uses this wonderful, simple, amazing system, from macrophages and skin cells, to dendritic cells and red blood cells, and... Oh. Right. Eidic cells do not use mitosis because they are big, stinky losers and try to prevent genetic disorders. They go undergo a separate process because they think they are so special. This process is known as meiosis. In meiosis, interphase still occurs the exact same as in mitosis. The cell still grows. The organelles still replicate. And the cell still grows a second time. However, prophase is far more different this time. One change that occurs is that prophase occurs twice, with the first prophase being known as prophase 1. Here, chromosomes that condense are known as homologous chromosomes. These are known as homologous chromosomes because these chromosomes are obtained directly from your parents. These homologous chromosomes link together using their chromosomal arms and form something known as a tetrad. The two chromosomes then exchange genetic information through their arms, which has a very important purpose I will explain later. Oh look, you can even see the chromosomes exchanging genetic information right now. Now, with the genetic material exchanged, the nucleus will begin to dissolve, and the centrioles, which are again exclusive to animals, are wrapped into spindle fibers. In metaphase 1, the tetrads are dragged to the equator of the cell by spindle fibers, all neatly lined up. Next is anaphase 1. In anaphase 1, the tetrads are split once more into normal chromosomal pairs, each with their unique set of DNA. After this is telophase 1. During telophase 1, 
the nuclear envelope reforms, the chromosomes decondense, and the new cell begins to split. Finally, after the cell splits, everything is good and the world is right. Not... Meiosis is weird, and there is a reason all of the phases have had a one after them. All the phases repeat. Now, after resting for a few minutes, the daughter cells prepare to enter P-mat again. The spindle fibers will begin to re-emerge. Nuclear membrane begins to dissolve again. Metaphase 2 is the same as metaphase 1, with the chromosomes moving towards the equator of the cells and the spindle fibers attaching to the centromeres. In anaphase 2, the sister chromatids that make up the chromosomes are split in half and dragged over to the opposite ends of the cells. Finally, in telophase 2, four nuclear envelopes form around each set of 23 chromosomes. Finally, in telophase 2, nuclear envelopes form around the 23 chromosomes. This happens in both daughter cells, produced from telophase 1. Finally, after two divisions, four haploid cells have been created. The four cells produced from meiosis are haploid daughter cells. Haploid means half. These cells only have half of the chromosomes a normal diploid cell would because of the double reduction and the creation of four cells, unlike mitosis, which only creates two. These daughter cells are very much genetically varied from one another due to crossing over. As the genetic material was mixed more and more, more variation occurred, leading to different traits of the offspring. But earlier, I mentioned that the chromosomes in prophase 1 crossed over. It was important, as the genetic exchange caused the future chromosomes and sister chromatids to have extreme amounts of genetic variety the more they were split and put into new cells. The sister chromatids all had their own unique set of genetic material obtained from crossing over, which was important for one main reason, reproduction. While meiosis may take longer, it produces both more cells and allows reproduction to be far safer. This is because of the genetic variety of the daughter cells from crossing over. If gametes had the same kind of DNA as their parent cells, the risk of genetic disease for the offspring would be incredibly high. These gamete cells are used only for reproduction and nothing else. As far as our microscopes have determined, these are the only two kinds of reproductive cells seen in the human body. Well, that's it on reproduction for now. I hope you learned something, because this took a very long time to make. Anyways, I'm going to leave now. I'll see you guys another time.